scroll through social media on Thursday, chances are you saw somebody saying something about name, image, and likeness. Thursday, July 1st, was the first day college athletes could profit off NIL. And some didn't wait a moment to capitalize. <laughs> hoping that we can touch every athlete in, in uh, college sports and they can do whatever they want with that, you know. So I think the main thing is just help these athletes capitalize off this new era in college sports. I talked to the Lewis. He made a platform that focused around the athlete and the athlete defined what the work was. And it was more so about building their own brand rather than a company that's just trying to use athletes to build up themselves. Um, and so for me, that seemed like the right decision. It was, you know, he's awesome dude, awesome vision, um, and, you know, and I'm excited to see what happens. We understand that these are young men and women that haven't had that real world experience yet from the ages of 18 to 22. Uh, so what we do is we make sure that everything is handled properly in our platform and it's a one-stop shop very easy to use. But the wonderful thing about the Dreamfield platform is it's actually up to the athlete how much they want to engage. Uh, we have businesses on the platform uh, that range from retail locations to restaurant locations to memorabilia companies that are now hiring these athletes to say, hey look, I'm going to hire you to come through for a couple hours to my retail location in Tampa and I want you to do a couple of autograph signings, autograph points of helmets and, then, and those individuals can do what they want with it. It truly is a platform run by athletes, for athletes, by athletes. Know this out there, Dreamfield is for the athletes and it really does sound very cool for these individuals to make money, not just football players, but across the sports spectrum. So first of all, I, I, we'll start. My name is Corey Stanisi. I'm the Director of External Affairs for Dreamfield. I'm joined with Neil Carter, um, who's down here locally in Broward County as well. And we're here with Representative Chip Lamarco, who was the sponsor of the NIL legislation, or name image likeness legislation here in the state of Florida, which ultimately was the, the game changer to push the envelope nationwide on this topic to allow for the first time ever in the history of the NCAA endorsement deals to be done with collegiate athletes um, across the spectrum. You everyone from a, an Olympic gymnast and track athlete all the way to a, a Florida State football player. Uh, we are fortunate enough that two of our co-founders and business partners is actually the quarterback at the University of Miami and the quarterback at Florida State, um, and Derek King and, and Mackenzie Millen. And they've been leaders on this topic for quite a while now. Um, as, as kind of the, the adults and the leaders in the room, they've been around for, for quite some time and overcame some injuries in their careers. Um, so we're fortunate to have them as business partners and have their, their insight. Um, but I guess we'll start with the question we get most of the time is what is name, image, and likeness? So name, image, and likeness really is the opportunity for a business or an entity to hire a college athlete for the use of their name, image, and likeness, which is now permissible under NCAA rules after the Supreme Court hearing a few months ago as well, um, and state because of state laws like the state of Florida that Representative Lamarca and, and Governor DeSantis ultimately uh, passed uh, about a year and a half ago. So platform like Dreamfield uh, came to be where we said, how can we make this process more efficient? How can we connect brands and businesses with these athletes that are hungry to do deals, whether on social media, as, as an influencer, or in person, autograph signings, photo opportunities. How do we do that in, in an efficient way where you don't have to send a athlete a direct message on Twitter or on Instagram or try to figure out are they working with an agent, are they not working with an agent, um, and try to make sure that you have direct access to a platform like ours and be able to help with the process and the payments, the tax documentation, because there's a lot more that goes into dealing with a college athlete under NCAA rules and team rules and compliance with the university themselves. So we make sure we're keeping the athlete compliant, the business compliant, we're making sure the athletes get in their proper tax documentation, whether it's a W-2, a 1099 at the end of the year, you don't have to track them down, give them a paycheck, uh, make sure that they sign in their W-2s, paying their taxes, doing all those things, we, we handle all that for the athlete. Uh, so we're, we're making this very efficient, and the beautiful thing about Dreamfield is the athlete is setting their own price, and they're keeping every dollar that they earn. So we're not taking any profit from the, from the, uh, from the athlete, 
And we just launched last week uh, what's called campaign mode. So now a brand, we're seeing very large brands, a large auto manufacturer. We're seeing a very large uh, restaurant group. Um, we're actually seeing a professional sports organization uh, that we're working with on, on getting a couple of deals done where they're coming to us saying, okay, we have an idea. We want to hire 30 or 50 athletes across the country or within this region or within a state like Florida. And this is what we want them to accomplish. We want them to have three Instagram posts. We want them to come in for a live event. And we want to put it out and, and essentially have an athlete bid on this job. So now we're putting it out, it's like, kind of like an RFP, where they're putting out a contract and saying, okay, I'm allowing athletes now bid on this contract. And then we're going through and sifting through and choosing which athletes we would like to partner with. Um, and this makes it a lot more efficient instead of throwing out you know, 100, 150 direct messages or trying to get a hold of an athlete. We're dealing with 17 to 24 year old individuals um, from all different backgrounds, all different regions, and our platform is making it very easy for them. So with that, um, we're gonna touch on a couple things here about what the platform actually does. So the, I guess I answered a lot of these questions, but really, you know, why do you wanna use a smart contracting software? And we're seeing a lot of companies come out and, and not use a software like ours, and then realizing that this is much more complicated. So the way you can, if, if you go onto the Dreamfield platform, onto the website at dreamfield.co, you can actually pick and choose which athletes. So we have athletes ranging from $25 an hour or certain prices for their social media engagement, all the way to $11,000 an hour. The starting quarterback at Ole Miss is charging $11,000 an hour and he's getting it. You know, they're signing deals that that's what his value is worth out there at, in Mississippi. But then we're seeing a lot of other athletes that are much lower engagements and, and actually, um, I think our female athlete, um, she's a gymnast at the University of Oklahoma, is charging, I think, $250 or $350 an hour. Um, and she has got a quarter million Instagram followers. So, you know, you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of bang for your buck, a lot of efficiencies here in, in this space where you can really have an ambassador of your brand, of your program, um, for a, very, a fraction of a price, especially consider, you know, what a, a professional athlete would cost, where they're charging 20,000 20, plus per hour. Um, if you want to hire Tua at the university at, at, uh, for the Miami Dolphins out of the University of Alabama, we're hearing he's fetching about 20, 20 grand an hour um, for a live event. So you can really get uh, some really good engagement um, for a fraction of the price. So again, we have a couple different options. We have marketing campaigns, influencer campaigns, uh, live events, fundraisers. We're seeing all, uh, all these different kinds of uh, uh, businesses engaging with college athletes. And we're seeing uh, actually 88% of deals done so far over the past month and a half across the nation have been social media influencing campaigns. We think that's actually probably the bread and butter of a lot of these, these athletes. And that's where when we were drafting this legislation, we saw that being the, the biggest boon for these athletes. Athletes are busy, they're students, they have to go to class, they have to, you know, this is a full-time job for them on top of school. Um, so being able to engage with them on social media where they're following is, is, is the greatest, um, is really where the deals are going. Um, and we're seeing, actually, the, the market came out um, and we're seeing that 80, so the highest paid athletes so far, um, what we've seen is about $210,000 in total endorsement deals. Um, that, but we're actually even seeing them, the average about $500 a month. So that's really the average across the whole country is about $500 per athlete. And it's really for social media engagement. So we're seeing local restaurants, whether you're you know, a restaurant in Deerfield Beach or you know, across the state in, in large, a large corporation, um, they're paying a couple hundred bucks a month and getting really, really, really good engagement um, out of these deals. And again, we can help with the marketing campaigns. Um, so we're, again, we're seeing inf you know, uh, brands come up with a marketing plan and say, okay, we want to hire X amount of athletes in the state of Florida or in, in the city of Tampa Bay, and this is what we're going to do, and, and, and um, we're helping facilitate those deals. So again, we're, we're working with everything from, from large enterprise businesses all the way down to small local mom and pop shops. Uh, I believe Cineholic in uh, Boca Raton hired the, the FAU quarterback. And the thing was like 200 bucks, they came in, took a couple photos, they closed down for like an hour, hour and a half, and they were able to you know, continue using his name. They have, uh, I think, a, a Cinnabon named after him, which is pretty cool. Um, and he keeps promoting it, and again, it cost that, that small mom and pop business uh, a very minor number, um, and now they you know, have something where the, the athlete keeps tracking back to that business, they keep tracking back on social media, and they keep getting an influx of business. Um, but really, the large consumer brands um, 
are going to find the most benefit in our platform based on making this easy for them for their taxes, the payroll, um, and not having to be so hands-on with each and every one of these athletes. As that's what we that's what we do. Yeah, I think a huge a, a, a huge part of this, um, in particular, um, speaking on the enterprise aspect of it, is the fact that it is that bespoke experience. It's that white glove experience where. If you uh, have multiple restaurants, you have a restaurant chain, and you you say, you know, like Corey mentioned earlier, you have an RFP, so to speak, and you say, this is the type of athlete we're looking for, this is what we want done, then that could be presented to multiple athletes and then to those athletes responding to that bid, and then you could select based on the athletes that have uh, approached you to, uh, to accept that bid. Um, that's regarding the enterprise platform. Now, regarding small businesses, you can then, you could go on the app from, so on the business side, you're doing this from a laptop or from your computer, and you're seeing what athletes are available, and you can contract them based on what they are, what their, their hourly rate is. You're not having to worry about taxes with these athletes, and you're not having to worry about the contracting of these athletes because the, the contracts are embedded within the application and you're both able to sign this contract together. So it's not as if you're having to run around, do the legwork, hire lawyers to make sure that you're compliant with uh, these athletes to make sure that they don't all of a sudden ruin their eligibility. One of the big, th big things that we encountered when NIL became legal is that many assumed that now everything was legal, like it was the Wild West, you could do whatever you want, you could throw money around at these athletes, and that's not the case. You, there are, you, you do have to be compliant with the university's uh, rules. Yeah, and one thing to, to hit on that, we're talking about compliance, um, a lot of the small businesses, you would, if you wanted to engage an athlete, you'd have to take that contract or hope that the athlete took the contract to the compliance department at that university and make sure that it is a, a good deal or a sound deal. Um, you know, some of the things we're seeing, you, you, you can't work with uh, like a medical marijuana company. Um, they really don't like uh, alcohol, tobacco, gaming. A lot of the schools have set rules against working with those companies. But really, restaurants seem to be the, the, prime, the prime target of a lot of these college athletes. Either they're fans locally, you know, they really enjoy that restaurant and they want to be a part of it and they want to be an ambassador of it. Um, but I, I, yeah, it, being compliant is the most important thing here and not ruining an athlete's eligibility. Um, and then, you know, having your brand also be associated with, with that would not be a good thing. So we're making sure that we're communicating directly with the athletic departments. The contracts are being disclosed to the athletic departments directly. Um, and they're allowed to, you know, come back either with revisions or edits or tell you that this is not a good deal or it is a good deal. Um, so we're making sure we're that extra layer of protection uh, between you and the athlete and the, the compliance department. One thing that, I, that really uh, sat with me when we first got into this was hearing that college athletes were the only people in the country that could not profit off of their name, image, and likeness. Think about that. So they're going out, they're putting their bodies at risk, and then they couldn't even profit off their own name, image, and likeness. To me, that was huge. The fact that you have Donald Delahaye, who was a kicker for the University of Central Florida a few years ago, the NCAA made him choose between having his YouTube channel, which he was monetizing, and playing college sports. And he ended up choosing his YouTube channel. He's a multimillionaire now because of it, but he had to make that choice. He shouldn't have had to make that choice. He should have been able to do both. So it's, it's, it's instances like that we're seeing Reagan Smith, an athlete who had to choose between being a professional athlete and, and making money that way and also being a college athlete. She had to then, she, cho she chose to remain in school, but she's one of the athletes on our platform now. So it gives you some sense of, of what was going on and why this was needed. You have 350 pound linemen that were on the same meal plan getting three meals a day. Granted, and you know, the, argue was, the argument is made, oh, well, you know, they're on a meal plan, they're getting three meals a day from the university. However, many of them are on the same meal plan as um, athletes that are much smaller than them and don't require uh, uh, as much food as they do. So, you know, six foot seven, 340 pound Vince Wilfork used to talk about it at University of Miami, that he was on the same meal plan as a young lady that was five foot one, 89 pounds. So, it, it, you, you could see why this was needed, and we're, we're, that, that was the main reason uh, that I know that this bill was created, was to protect these athletes, 
and it's the main reason why Dreamfield was created. Yeah, well, we'll certainly talk about the social justice part of it as well here at the My end with, with the, rep with the representative, that, that's for sure. <laughs> Dan, did you have your question? I was just curious, you guys are more like an agent, right? You're the agent between the business and the... Uh, Kind of. So at first, a lot of agents actually were skeptical of us. They thought we were trying to replace them. And it's actually not the case. We're actually not agents. We do have an, a, a registered agent that does work for us, the young man that was with me yesterday. Um, uh, but we're not agents. But I, I'll put it this way. It's more of the Airbnb model, right? You know, we have someone who owns a home, and then they're trying to find a tenant or a renter. And the renter's trying to find a home. We're trying to connect that that potential tenant and, and the home um, together. as really what it is, because you have a lot of athletes that are looking to do deals with certain brands, we're trying to make it easy and compliant for that brand to find that athlete. But can I ask, so if I've got a restaurant, I have a certain marketing budget, I can go to you and say, look, we have X amount, this is what we're thinking. You guys will go out and find that athlete for us and say, this is what we have. That, that's correct. So you could do, again, one of two ways. So you can either go onto the website and just book them directly. You'll see on their, on their page, the athlete's page, they'll set their own price for either a live event, per hour or for social media engagement. And they'll even have their own calendar up there as well. So if you did want to do an in-person autograph signing or if you want to do an in-person photo op at your restaurant or at your retail location or at your hotel, uh, you can actually book that athlete directly through our platform. It's seamless. The contract will get sent to the athlete. It'll get sent to you. It'll also get sent to the compliance department. And it'll just, again, seamless process. You don't have to pay the athlete directly. We will hold the money to make sure the athlete completes the job. We will actually also make sure that you have made the payment before the athlete goes to the location to do the job. So we make sure, again, we're the intermediary to make sure it goes smoothly. Again, just like an Airbnb would. You know, we're not, Airbnb says I'm not a hotel company, I'm just a platform. So we're saying the same thing. We're not an agent, we're just a platform. And agents actually do love us because we're not taking a profit out of the, the athlete's side. So we're not double dipping on the athlete. So it's free for you to get onto the platform on a dream field as a business and an athlete and the only, way, the only time that we actually make money is when a transaction is completed. So we just charge a small booking fee from the advertiser, from the business who's booking that athlete just to make sure we cover the compliance. You know, we have some expenses that go into that obviously and some software. We handle all our payments through Stripe, so it's very secure. Um, and then all of our, uh, you know, the compliance kicks in and then all of a sudden the, the taxation kicks in. We withhold sales tax if it's necessary in certain states as well too. How are you finding those athletes? Are they coming to you or are they going out? They are coming to us, and then we also have an athlete services team that are reaching out to athletes every single day. Um, we actually can't verify them fast enough. We, we, we're over 500 athletes on the platform, so we're verifying the athlete and the business. We want to make sure that you are hiring who is on the platform, and that you're not, it's not a catfish situation. Um, we're also making sure that you are who you say you are, so we're checking your business tax ID, making sure that you're a legitimate company as well, and making sure that you're also a compliant company, you know, and not a medical marijuana company or an alcohol company that is, is banned from doing the, these things, we, to not have any, uh, any mix-ups. Could you give an example, maybe uh, some restaurants you work with successful? Sure, yeah, uh, our day one event that Neil was at and then that Representative Lamarck and I were at in Tallahassee was the Wharf down in Miami. Um, the Wharf uh, had a really successful event with uh, the quarterback at the University of Miami. Uh, it was a big photo op, but they had a lot of people show up, they promoted it ahead of time, um, and then we had an event at Miller's Ale House. Um, I actually just saw John Hodge yesterday, and he was telling me that their earned media is just over two and a half million dollars for earned media from that one event with Mackenzie Mellon and his five teammates um, on July 1st, and the, the earned media is still coming in from, from that event. So there really is a, and I, not to disclose it, but I'll tell you, I mean, the fee was, for a marketing budget, is, was nominal, a nominal fee um, to, to bring those, those athletes in and have their social media engagement and then the media covered as well. Um, yeah, we're working on full team deals. We actually just in Sports Illustrated two days ago, we brokered a deal um, with the entire Florida State football team with a cryptocurrency. So a cryptocurrency came and said, okay, we want to hire college athletes. And they actually said they were going to do it at the University of Miami first and that they would handle it themselves and they didn't need us. About three weeks later, they called us back and said, okay, we need your help. Um, we, we, this is a lot harder than we thought to, to kind of corral these, these, these athletes together and get them to talk to one another and then get these contract signed and they don't really want to sign a contract without someone looking at it and a lot of times these athletes don't have money to run to buy an attorney or an accountant so they're relying on people like us to have them already on the platform someone they trust and and so now they came to us and said okay we want to hire the entire Florida State football team uh, the deal it's about $500 a month per player 
no matter what, if you accept the deal, whether you're offensive lineman or starting quarterback, that's the deal. We want three social media engagement posts each month, and they're accepting. I think we're up to 71 athletes that have accepted the deal so far, which is fantastic. And um, we're actually working on something really neat right now. I can't disclose who it is or what the school is, but with the entire uh, athletic department of just the females. Every one of the, so 200 female athletes will be signing what looks to be a, an endorsement deal with a large brand coming up here sometime soon. We're excited about it. It's nationwide. It's nationwide. Yeah, yeah, the nationwide for our platform. That's a great question. Um, initially, there were only going to be a few states, but then, what was it right before? I'll let you touch on the numbers as to when that uh, when that came to. Yeah, be. Chip, you want to take that? Actually, one? yeah, Chip. Would be the, yeah, the yeah. So uh, uh, a lot, a lot of folks. Uh, so I serve in the state the legislature. Uh, my district goes from. Pretty much Danielle's restaurant to Port Everglades, so along the beautiful coast of Broward County, and Corey was my legislative aide. And um, you know they say if you if you if you if you like someone, set them free, and if they like you, they'll come back. And here we are. So uh, he, he's not working for me anymore as of the as of this bill becoming uh, becoming law on July one. That being said, uh, we looked at um, you know some of these issues, and we said, well, we're we're I would take a step back. What, what, this is all about fairness for me. This was not about because I liked the, the Seminoles or the Hurricanes or I liked women's soccer or women's volleyball. It was about human beings, men and women who go to college and for the vast majority of them, 96%, there, there is no chance for them to play professional sports or get paid for what they do. And a, a lot of times my wife was a high school volleyball player and her team won a state championship twice at Cardinal Gibbons. She didn't get play. She didn't play sports in college. But if she did, there's, there's, you know, other than beach volleyball, there's no place to go. Um, so the, for me, the fairness issue was that, that whether it's football or women's soccer, I looked at uh, Donald Delahaye as, as uh, Neil mentioned. And here's a kid who came out of Port St. Lucie. Uh, parents came here from another country. He's kicking a football at University of Central Florida and making some creative and, and uh, if it's your style, and I thought they were pretty funny, uh, engaging YouTube videos. Well, he was told he couldn't do that and, and get his scholarship. He wasn't putting any uh, trade secrets in, in, in the videos. He wasn't telling any of the plays that the, you know, the next team might know, that, you know about uh, the next day. So there was no reason other than the fact that there was this overriding uh, organization that was set up 100 years ago for the safety of athletes called the NCAA, uh, wielding their power, and really it was, it was it was too much. And then we looked at, uh, there was a young lady who was uh, Venezuelan born, played in the uh, 21 and up, or 21 and under, sorry, league in Venezuela. Her name was Dana Castellanos. And she, when, when we were looking at this bill, when I was considering it, um, Corey had me excited about it, but I was, it's still, well, can we get this thing done? And uh, Dana was, was on the Florida State Championship uh, soccer team. And she had 1.2 million Instagram followers. By the time we passed this bill, she graduated Florida State. She had 1.5 million Instagram followers. She couldn't get a nickel off of any of that, of her, who she was and why she was important to that championship team. Uh, but the minute she crossed the stage at, uh, at the Civic Center in Tallahassee and walked over to the hotel next door to sign a, sign a deal with Nike, she became a multimillionaire. And it, it, the, the travesty is that a lot of these kids, that's not an option. And so it might be, for example, it might be the kids that, that get 500 bucks a month. And guess what? That's spending money they didn't have before. Um, and whatever sport they're playing, male or female, and wherever they come from, that could be the difference between being able to you know, take someone on a date or you know, be able to do something or go home and see their you know, sick parent or something. And what's, what was interesting, so you, you, asked, you, you were talking about the date. Um, so July 1 was our date, 2020. We moved that off in, uh, before the bill got passed in March of 2020, mm -hmm. I think it was. And we moved it off. We didn't know COVID was coming, nobody did, but we moved it off because it was just, it was, it was gonna be before anybody could really get the compliance set up in the universities, any of the, any of the organizations could, could get ready for this. So we moved off to 2021. So as July 20, July 1, 2021, which is only, you know, just two months, less than two months ago, uh, as I was approaching the NCAA, who was the organization I spoke of, uh, basically we had asked, we had reached out to them. We had, uh, a lot of other folks had been reaching out to them to talk about this issue. California, by the way, California passed this very same bill that we did, um, similar. They called it the Fair Pay to Play uh, Act, which we thought was a terrible name. But that being said, they, didn't, they weren't going to be implemented until 2023. So we said, all right, if we can get the same bill passed, basic framework, Let's do it before California. So we were on everyone's everyone's uh, 
you know, uh, board as far as it's going to happen in Florida before anybody else. And guess what? The I'm just going to say it the way I saw it. It's about football and it's about the SEC. The University of Florida, who fought us the entire way of this bill, decided that it was so important they started recruiting off it as soon as we passed it. And then Alabama, the state of Alabama had a, had a bill. The state of Louisiana, the state of uh, Georgia, and Mississippi. Well, those are all the schools in the SEC. So this bill was going to be, we were all going to become live on July 1 of 2021. And the real irony in all of this, the Supreme Court came up with their, their findings that, as, as Neil said, uh, only in college athletics can a man or a woman uh, be treated less, less than anybody else on, on the planet, certainly in the United States, and not be able to uh, benefit from their hard work and their labor. And ultimately, the NCAA just threw their hands up. They kept saying they were going to come up with rules for name, image, and likeness. And what they finally did is just said, you know what, we're just going to, we're going to omit that entire section of our guidelines. There are no rules in name, image, and likeness. So what that did for Florida is it probably made Florida a little more stringent than the states outside of the ones that did legislation, which some might think is a penalty. I think is a, is a blessing because it's going to keep the athletes more in a, uh, a compliant manner. It's going to give them the ability to do all these things and work with great companies like Dreamfield. But what's probably most interesting is, you know, in, in Florida, you know, we have these athletes, and we talked about, was 11,500 or so, mm -hmm. and everybody thought it was going to be just the quarterback and maybe the, maybe the, you know, the one player on the, on the defense and then a couple athletes here and there. If you watch the Olympics, you saw the University of Florida had multiple swimmers get gold medals. Well, in the past, if they came back and tried to do something back at the University of Florida based on who they are and what they, what they do in, in the pool, uh, they, they could have lost their, their, their uh, scholarship to go to school. It happened in Colorado with a, with a uh, snow skier who came back and played football and you know, had to make that decision. So now those gold medal athletes, whether, whether it's a gymnast in Oklahoma or a, a swimmer at the University of Florida can come back and benefit off who they are and you know, hopefully restaurants like in, you know, for example, in, in Gainesville, you've got Spurrier's, you've got other restaurants, you've got Miller's like in Tallahassee. All of these college towns have, uh, have car dealers, they have marketing agencies that do a million different things. But at the end of the day, uh, as Corey had mentioned, a lot of it's probably going to come through restaurants. I mean, uh, we've got a restaurant tour here that I happen to really, really like the restaurant. It's in my district in, in Deerfield Beach, Oceans 234. And if Danielle wanted to have uh, the starting, uh, does FAU have a soccer team? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, you, if she wanted to have the, the women's soccer team or the volleyball team from FAU right down the street come and have a, a reception, she could also turn it into, well, let me invite all of the local high school athletes so they can meet these, uh, these college athletes and have someone to look up to, that type of thing. Bring them to a restaurant, create more revenue in the restaurant, and create an, an atmosphere where those college athletes can earn a little bit of money, but they can also maybe meet some other folks in the neighborhood. So, I mean, to me, it was just a fairness issue. Yeah, and, and the good thing about this opportunity for a restaurant or other businesses, the, the, the possibilities are almost endless. You know, so as, as the representative was just mentioning, we've seen some businesses come to us and say, okay, I would like to do a ladies' night at my restaurant. I would like to, on a Tuesday night, it's, it's, it's a slow night, but I'm going to go ahead and hire five, six softball players, and I'm going to bring them in. It's going to cost me a couple hundred dollars. I'm going to bring them into the restaurant that night, and we're going to promote it ahead of time through their own social media, our social media as the business and the platform, and we're going to go ahead and, and promote it as a ladies' softball night to the youth softball teams, the travel softball programs, and we're going to bring a bunch of people into the restaurant, and we're going to sell a bunch of zingers that night, you know, at Mills Ale House, and that's what we're going to do on, on an off night, and we're going to make it this social justice cause, and we're going to have you just be, you know, for, for for the, for the women and for the ladies. So um, yeah, again, the possibilities are absolutely endless. Um, different businesses can engage. We're seeing apartment complexes engage. Uh, we're seeing professional sports organizations engage. Um, as you can see, you know, the Florida Panthers signed our business partner, De'Ara King, to you know, the first ever professional sports organization. A hockey team hired a quarterback. Um, as you can see, you, know, you can see the, uh, the pastry over there, uh, the Mills Jail House on the left. Um, you know, again, Endless, endless opportunities and restaurants seem to be the ones taking the most advantage of, of, of name, image, and likeness. So I know. So hold on a second. So I don't know if everybody realizes how, how interesting that is, that bottom right picture. You've got a National Hockey League team here in, in Broward County, the Florida Panthers, engaging with a college athlete who doesn't play hockey, plays football. Correct. And so you're, you're cross marketing a sport, professional to, uh, to collegiate. A guy who will probably never play hockey. Maybe, maybe he might get interested in. I try to convince him to come play for my beer league team. Become an enforcer. But. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> you know, you, you've got teams like the Florida Panthers who are pretty, uh, 
uh, pretty engaging in the community and, and saying, hey, you know, we should have a football player as, you know, as one of our ambassadors. And I just, right. think, I just think that's the coolest thing. And, and ma'am, to answer, before I get to your other question, answer your first question, yes, it's nationwide. So there's about 25 states that either have a law or an executive order on the book. So there's about 35 that don't. So that leaves the NCAA on June 30th, about six hours before the deadline, they waved the white flag and said, you know, you're on your own schools, you figure it out. So now each school has different rules. So it's our job to help manage or help navigate that process to make sure that your deal that you would like with an athlete, whether it's in the state of Utah or in Illinois or in Alabama, we're following those state laws and we're keeping you compliant and the athlete compliant. That's our main goal. Okay, so here's a couple questions. So you see over there, your nationwide, how many athletes do you have that are not based in Florida? I would have to get, I can get that number. Okay, number two. Mm -hmm. So they actually don't have to disclose to the NCAA. The deal has to be disclosed to the university. Even our state law says it just has to be disclosed to the university and it's up to the university's discretion how they want to do that. So a lot of these universities have partnered with some other software that's not Dreamfield. Um, one's called Athliance, one's called Influencer. And they have a compliance software where their athletes have a portal. We are actually the trusted partner of both of those compliance software. So if you want to sign a deal with the or Florida State University, for example, with this crypto, yummy crypto, the cryptocurrency, once they accept the deal through our platform, it's already being disclosed right through influencers' software, and it's going right to their compliance department, which is the beautiful thing about this whole, the whole process, is it's all seamless, and we're, we're the trusted advisor and trusted partner of those, the compliance software companies that are working directly with those schools, because in a state like Florida, it actually, the law says if you have a contract with the university, you may not be dealing with the athlete. So we had to make a choice about a year ago and say, do we want to be on the side of the university or do we want to be on the side of the athlete? And we chose the athlete all day, every day. Yes. Just to be clear, I was just wondering, um, so the athletes don't pay a registration fee to, to be with you? No, so no registration fee from the athlete and no registration fee for the business either. So you can get on the website right now and go take a look at, the, I hate calling it this, but the inventory. And the inventory really is the time of the athlete. You're, you're renting the time for the athlete, whether it's a social media you know, engagement or an in-person live event. Um, so the only, the only way that we, we make money on the booking fee. So when you actually engage with that athlete and you click submit and, I, and click hire, we take a small platform fee to make sure everything's compliant. And compliance has come up a couple of times as far as, is, and, and Corey mentioned, like medical marijuana business or uh, alcohol, things like that. Most of that, the vast majority of that is governed by team rules. And when, we were, when I was bringing this bill through the legislative process through multiple committees, uh, that came up. And, and for example, the, ex the example I use, and a couple of folks who are probably more my age will remember this, but Randy Moss was a wide receiver at Florida State. He didn't graduate from Florida State because he broke team rules and he ended up going to another school and succeeded tremendously in the professional leagues. But uh, the, the reason that, that we didn't have to do anything with the compliance specific issues is each team will say, well, you can't be associated with adult entertainment. You can't be associated with alcohol. You can't be associated with um, you know, things like that. So that, that's all going to happen within the schools and that's kind of where the compliance piece is. Yep. So that's an interesting question. So you know, we're, we're not working with, with Barstool, but I've been following that very closely. I'm a huge fan of Barstool myself, and I thought it was pretty brilliant what they, what they did. Unfortunately, you're right. There are major compliance issues with that, and most institutions have taken, uh, they've taken offense to it. So actually, uh, the University of Louisville just last week came out and said, you, you, our athletes cannot work with this company because Barstool, at the end of the day, is a sports wagering company, it's a sports betting company, and they're owned by a, a casino company. So they said, we're, we're, you're not allowed to be involved in, in gaming, you know, uh, even though we're sitting here at a casino, you know, the Hard Rock c cannot sponsor an athlete. That's just not something that's kosher. They didn't like that. They, they actually said, no, no longer can our athletes work with Barstool Sports, and Barstool, unfortunately, by not using a platform like ours, we actually did reach out at one point and try to talk to them and say, look, you should really try to run your, these deals through a platform like us so we can keep you compliant, make sure you're doing the right thing and kind of keep it arm's length. Um, they weren't really interested in that just yet. Um, but also at the end of the day, they're, they're putting out promotions with the logos of the schools. 
that's a huge problem, a huge trademark issue. You have to get that license from either one of the third party licensors, like a Fanatics, or you have to work with the university to make sure you're getting that trademark. So when you see a lot of these promotions with the college athlete, you'll see the logos are scrubbed, right? I mean, we see this even in the professional ranks. Um, whether it's a, you know, a hockey commercial, you see you know, where an individual's being endorsed and on a TV commercial and they're wearing a red, black, and white jersey, you know it's a Chicago Blackhawks jersey, but there's no Chicago Blackhawks logo. Um, we're seeing the same thing happen in college. And actually, the, the young man that was with us yesterday that works for us, he actually brokered through, through you know, working with us with Dreamfield, brokered the first ever uh, co-branded uh, T-shirt jersey. So the University of Alabama, he got the trademark right from the University of Alabama, got his, his client um, that he manages on, on the side. Um, outside of Dreamfield, he got his client who's a linebacker to get on the same page, sign a deal with a t-shirt and apparel company. So now you can actually buy his shirt with his name, his number, it's the same font from the jerseys from the University of Alabama with the Alabama A on it and it's being sold in Dick's Sporting Goods. So that's happening, but you have to go through the proper channels. And we're helping facilitate those proper channels to make sure you're doing it the right way. We've come across, and you'll see in the media, there are going to be many outlets, and I'm not going to name names, but you'll see certain outlets that'll, you know, where these famous celebrity business owners come out and they say, well, and, and they, they love a certain school, maybe it's their alma mater, and they say, well, I'm going to pay that, the, every athlete at that school X amount of dollars as long as they're an athlete for that school. You can't just come out and do that because it's pay for play. And they're... This is so new that there's not an understanding, there's not a common understanding of the rules. And that's, what, that's where we come in and we're able to help with that. So, you know, the, the, the barstool situation and how he just, if you saw the post from that, when a, one, one of the athletes, it was, it was right, wild, right. one of the athletes got on, you know, just simply messaged him on social media and said, hey, can I be a sponsored athlete? And he just, just said at the, in that moment without thinking about it. Yeah, why not? Absolutely. This is this is the one time. This is the one time that quid pro quo is actually necessary. You have to have a, a good or service exchanged with that athlete. You can't just give them money because that, that that is no different than what we saw in the past. That according to most athletic directors, does not happen unless it's at a different school. The duffel bag of cash or McDonald's bag of cash being dropped off at some you know kid's dorm room door. I mean, those are things that we hear about, you don't actually know if they're going on or not. Um, but essentially what you would be doing is, if, if it's for an endorsement deal, or you claim it's an endorsement deal, and you're just giving an athlete money, but not having them return either a social media post or some form of in-person event, something of value back to the business, then that is pay for play and you, that, that, that athlete could lose their eligibility. That is something that's not protected by our state law and the NCAA still can come down on them for that. So I work, I'm with Brooklyn in North Central County, and literally July 1st, we signed five women athletes from Central County. So if you are a GMO, I don't know if there's any other GMOs or if there's zeros, but it's also valuable for us. What we do is we take college players uh, and athletes that are from our hometown and we get to tell their story. So that's also a way to yeah, we're seeing, so our partner, Mackenzie Milton, even though he's the quarterback now at Florida State, he actually has signed uh, maybe only one, or I think Miller's might have been his only deal in Tallahassee. He signed probably, you know, half a dozen back in Orlando because he's still more popular in Orlando from his time at UCF. Um, you know, he's still kind of a legend over there. And in Tallahassee, he hasn't played a down yet, so people don't really know him. Um, but people are hiring their hometown heroes coming back home, even though they may play for the University of Wisconsin or Nebraska, if they come from Delray Beach, we're seeing businesses engage with them back at home because that's where their following is, that's where their base is, and people from their local high schools come and they want to meet them and want to see them and be a part of it. Yeah, so you're 100% right. Gentleman in the back of the room with the yellow tie, runs our airport, <laughs> Mark Gale. Uh, you know, the beauty about uh, name, image, and likeness is you could be a fan of any team. You could be a fan of America's team, or you could be a fan of our airport director's team, the one that has fizzled out in Philadelphia for many years. <laughs> I, want to, I want to thank this, this panel and Corey and your group come, coming last minute to show up. A little story, United Chances came to this conference three years ago, I think, for 
Lauderdale. We have five people that show up for a virtual ghost kitchen. That gentleman right now is probably making Three years from now, we're going to have a black dog in our first place. It's still a little bit of the Wild West. Thank you for clearing up some, a lot of great questions and answers. Yes, Jim. Just, just uh, something kind of in closing is, and, and our airport director, Mark Gale, is a friend of mine. I was kidding with him a little bit. And Ramola and uh, Danielle, who are here, it, it, I, want, I just want to say, look, it, we've got some uh, things going on in Florida that no, nobody else has on the, in the United States or anywhere else. And uh, it's our job, look, I feel as an as elected official and somebody in the, in the legislative process, it's our job to brag about the state. It's our job to fund organizations that market our state. Um, it's not always the most popular thing on one side or the other, but I strongly believe that we, you know, we need to do our part and, and tell our story. And I think this is just one small way. And, you know, there's 11,000 athletes in, in the collegiate level at Florida, but there's, there's hundreds of thousands in the United States. And we need to make sure that, you know, we kind of tell our, brand, our story. And our story is our local, our local brands. And uh, now we have more ambassadors and, you know, the kids playing sports can be ambassadors just like, uh, you know, restaurant lodging folks. Thank you all. Yes, sir.